Thank you, John. It's very good to be back here. I mean, already I see a lot of familiar, friendly faces. It's been a little bit of time since I was here last. Uh, as John says, for the past few years now, I've been in this role of international president for the Theosophical Society. Theosophical Society spread all around the world. And so part of what has come with that is that I too, and Lily too, have been spread all around the world. In all honesty, this may sound strange, but this is the first time in almost two years that I'm speaking to an American audience. I mean, I'm from around here. <laughs> I live in Chicago. But you know what that has meant is that in places various and sundry, in speaking to a group such as this, there is this kind of a medium between me and you, which is the translator. So what I have found is that there are a lot of ways to translate. In some places, you have this kind of UN type approach, where as you speak, everybody's got headphones on, and they're getting the translation simultaneously, which that's kind of nice. Another way, which is the more usual way, is I'll say what I have just said, and I step to the side, and somebody else repeats it in some language I don't understand. There is one form of translation I ran into in India, which was the one that I actually prefer. This particular time, we were in Karnataka. It's a state in India, which it's a single state, but the number of members in the Theosophical Society is greater than the entire United States uh, membership. United States is the second largest uh, section. But anyway, I got there, and I asked the translator, you know, how do you want to do it? We'll get our rhythm and all that. She said, no, you just speak. I said, but how are you going to translate? She said, no, go, don't worry about it. Speak. And so I gave my talk, and probably 20% of the people who were in the audience uh, were sufficiently fluent in English to get it. After I got done, she steps up and starts talking and just recaps everything that I said, apparently. But when she recaps it, people are sitting in the front of their seats, <laughs> clapping their hands. It's like she was a preacher. You know, so I said, this is the type of translator I want. You know? <laughs> Anytime I'm in Karnataka, you're the one. Also, there's this condition that my accent in India is very strange. I mean, here I think I speak very plainly, but in India it's an extremely strange, exotic, and often difficult to understand accent for people who speak English. So anyway, all that to say, it's good to be back. <laughs> it's good to be back. Anyway, during our time together tonight, we wanted to talk about self-transformation. I think specifically it's as the journey of self-transformation. It's a big topic, but I think if for those who have found themselves in these seats, which is to say people to whom there is some sort of a, at least interest in the spiritual life, and in its cultivation, uh, if it's something that is more than just an academic interest, then it becomes a very important topic, this whole subject of what it is that it means to transform, and how it is that that becomes something that is not just a concept, but something that is an actual experience for us. Because quite honestly, the spiritual traditions around the world abound with ideas and concepts that can be studied for a lifetime. But 
this point that I think is of most interest, particularly within this theosophical realm, is how do these things become applied and how do they become active within our own consciousness? So I think that's the track that I'd like to follow you know, in our time together. Obviously, it's something where in this act of speaking, you know, the hope is always that something can occur by way of this kind of transmission. We do it with words, that's what we're stuck with. But obviously, the uh, deeper levels of this exceed our possibility to express, and specifically with this aspect of self-transformation. So what is it? You know, we th use these words, and we have the feeling that we have an idea of what it might mean. And probably we do. But maybe in our time together, we can look at it from two aspects. Uh, as with many things, we think in terms of the flip side of the coin, but it's all one coin. So with self-transformation, there is this aspect of it being a process that we engage in. So on the one hand, it's a process. And a process can be described. It can be taught. It can be learned. You know, the traditions of the world, the spiritual traditions of the world, that's the business that they are in. Teaching the methods, the ideas that relate to this process of self-transformation. So, you know, you have the yoga tradition and its eight limbs of yoga. You have Buddhism. In Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about the Lam Rim, the graded path to enlightenment, or the graded path to, we could say, self-transformation. Theosophical society, we tend to focus on the idea of study, meditation, service as a path that addresses this process of self-transformation. These things can be taught. These are, in fact, the areas in which we tend to focus our efforts when we find that uh, the spiritual direction is worthy of making a practice, making a discipline. So those are the areas. So a process is one avenue that would speak to this whole matter of self-transformation. But then on the other hand, a process can take you so far. But the actual experience of transforming is perhaps even unrelated to the process. So there's a process and there is equally an event that occurs. You could say there is a moment at which we become transformed. And these two things are related, but not necessarily as closely linked as we would like to think. So, examples of transformation. In the natural world, there are a lot of different things, or a few things we can point to. I'm no quantum physicist. You know, nobody would accuse me of that. But uh, I know enough of it to know that there's this concept about what they call quantum leap, quantum jump. So the electron that orbits the atom's nucleus orbits at a certain, there's a certain orbit that it is in. If enough energy is radiated into that electron, it moves to a new orbit. But the fascinating thing about this movement from one orbit to another is that it happens not gradually, but immediately. And as far as the science of it is concerned, there is no 
movement between this intervening gap. It's sudden, it's complete, it's immediate. It's transformed to a completely new level of functioning. In the biological world, quite a remarkable example. I mean, all of us know about the caterpillars that turn into butterflies, right? I mean, probably you know that the caterpillar spins the cocoon, comes out eventually as a butterfly. Many of you have not done the experimentation of trying to find out what's actually going on inside of that cocoon because you're nice people. <laughs> you don't do that sort of thing. And probably you are also never children or either probably you're not telling the truth. <laughs> you know, it's something in that spectrum. Uh, as a child, I do remember just being fascinated by this idea of these worms with legs spinning a cocoon and coming out a butterfly. You know, something that lived eating the leaves comes out and now flies through the air and lives only off the nectar. And I wondered what was happening inside of this little hidden space. And so I opened one. And it was <coughs> mind-boggling. I had certain expectations of what I would see, as we all would. You know, I opened it and I expected I might see something that's like half worm, half butterfly, some, something that would fit this transformation from one form to another. What you see, however, and I'll tell you this so you don't have to do it yourself, <laughs> when you open these cocoons, at a certain stage, what you open it and see is a, just a gooey kind of blob, no form whatsoever. <laughs> Somehow or another, the caterpillar goes into the cocoon and there's something that it secretes where the entire form dissolves and then reforms as this new creature, uh, this butterfly. And so as an example of transformation, this is uh, more true, I think, to the process than what we might think. An example I like to give, and it might require you to visualize just a little bit. Uh, if you can imagine, those of you who have ever been to the seashore, often you're at the seashore and there'll be a puddle by the sea. And it's a puddle and it's just sitting there. It's got its little containment of water. But at a certain point, there will be a wave that comes in, that washes across this puddle. In that particular moment, the consciousness of the puddle, which was confined to this little tiny amount of water, for a moment takes on the characteristics of the ocean itself. It becomes oceanic universalized in its moment of awareness. The water goes out and it's the same shape. To our eyes, everything is the same, but in fact, all of the water that composed it before is new. You find expressions about this sort of uh, transformation of consciousness in the scriptures of the world. Uh, very often when I'm in India, I find myself giving references, scriptural references from the Bible. Because in India, that's exotic. <laughs> it's like, you're talking about some foreign religion from someplace else. But you know, there's this idea we read where it says, behold, I make all things new. This Alteration of consciousness is what we're talking about when we speak about self-transformation. So, what is it in terms of the process? Let's look at the process first. A uh, great English language poet uh, 
William Blake at one time wrote, if the doors of perception were cleansed, then we would see everything as it is, infinite. If the doors of perception were cleansed. So this is a poetic approach to the process of transforming, the cleansing of the doors of perception, the organs of knowledge, they would call it perhaps in uh, Indian spirituality, the yanandriyas, you know, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, are the ways in which we receive knowledge from the world around us. And they're constantly deceiving us. I mean, we know that. I mean, just the visual aspect of it. When I look at all of you, you seem to be such solid, distinct things. But we know that's not true. You know, all of us are more space than matter, all of those sorts of common knowledges. Every single sense, due to our conditioning, due to the fact that we look to see what we look to see, all of these things condition what it is that these senses report to us. If they were cleansed, we might see things accurately. There's a wonderful expression a friend of mine shared with me. Supposedly, it came from Confucius. What he said was, the wisest man he knows is his tailor, the person who sews his clothes. He said, because every time he sees me, he measures me anew. We don't do that. The fact that I have seen you before, the fact that I have witnessed you in your moments of grandeur, your moments of frailty, becomes who you are when I see you next. And we do that with each other. I mean, it's the whole, it's the whole role of family dysfunction and you know, the sorts of relationships that we cultivate and perpetuate are based on this uncleansed doors of perception. And basically, when we're talking about this process, really there's one thing that we're talking about. There's a little book that was written by a man by the name of James Allen many, many years ago. Lovely little book. If you haven't read it, you should. Short, to the point. It's called As a Man Thinketh. It's been translated all over the world. It's actually been put into a version called As a Woman Thinketh, you know, to try and balance this gender dysfunction that we have. The ideas are the same. It's just different gender relation. But before, as a preface to the book, he wrote a little bit of a poem. And I think the poem expresses the idea of the book quite wonderfully, a rhyming little poem. He says, mind is the master power that molds and makes, and man is mind, and evermore he takes the tool of thought and shaping as he will, brings forth a thousand joys and a thousand ills. He said, we think in secret and it comes to pass, environment is but our looking glass. It's wonderful. It is correct. It is esoterically profound. And it gives you, it points us in a certain direction. Similar idea expressed the very first verse of the Dhammapada, the sayings of the Buddha, relates exactly to this same idea. It says that all that we are is the result of our thoughts. This is the Buddha talking now, not James Allen. He's not an American. 
<laughs> so this has more weight. <laughs> All that we are is the result of our thoughts. It is founded on them. It is made of them. And then he gives a couple of examples. He says, if a person speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows them like the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the cart. It's a beautiful image. It can stick with you. He said, if someone speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness <coughs> follows them like the never departing shadow. Just at the time your shadow leaves you is when happiness will leave you if you're acting from a pure thought. So all of it, you know, when we talk about transformation, when we talk about anything related to the spiritual life, for us as human beings, it comes down to the mind. So our understanding of that is crucial. Theosophical perspective would say this. If you were to ask the question, what is a human being? We might describe it by biological processes. There are a lot of different ways you could describe it. From a perspective of the ageless wisdom, there's a very succinct definition that the human being is highest spirit and lowest matter linked by mind, the bridge between these two poles of spirit and matter is the mind. And where you have this spirit, this matter, this mind linking them, there you have a human being. Chew on it a while. But it says a lot in the sense that it speaks about one of our hidden potentials, you could say that this mind has the capacity to move from one pole completely to the other. And so the way in which we position, we could say, our consciousness will completely determine our experience. What we see will be completely determined by where we see from. If we turn our vision and our focus is on all things material, when we look at this world, for instance, there's a lot of different things going on. It can be a little bit confusing. Uh, you know, if, in fact, the focus of the mind is purely on the world of things and stuff, then generally what we're looking for, we want more of it. <laughs> so we become engaged because that's the direction of our mind. So, conversely, there, the whole sort of patterning process that we engage in with this spiritual path is, initially, it's an attempt, it's an effort, and it's a strong effort that's required to turn our attention, to turn the mind from its obsession with looking down to looking up, you could say. I mean, these terms down and up are utterly irrelevant, but it's the way we're used to speaking. So turn it from looking toward matter to looking toward spirit. That's the point of spiritual practice. That's the point of meditation. That's the point of thought awareness. So that gradually, on this continuum of mind, we find ourselves positioned in a direction where what attracts us, what we are concerned with, is this spiritual dimension. I think, from my perspective, it is safe to say, I'll probably have to explain myself, but that really we know nothing about spirit. We 
have ideas about it. I think we can speak from the effects that we witness where this thing that we might call spirit makes its imprint. But ultimately, the capacity for our minds to, it's not something that is graspable in a mental context. But it's something that still can be experienced. Equally, we know nothing about matter, which I think will be a surprising thing to say, given the nature of our science, which is very well developed, and for which for the past 400 years has made a study of solely one thing, which is the material world. I mean, everything related to the material world has been studied, and yet, until 1990, there was this uh, view in the scientific community, big, big sort of thinking about the nature of the universe. And so the idea was that the universe is expanding at a certain rate, but you know, given the effects of gravity, ultimately it'll pull on it and it will collapse. And so this was conventional thinking. Everything that we could see pointed in this direction. They sent up the Hubble telescope, and it was taking photographs of you know, very, very distant sorts of uh, nebulae, far, far away. And then what came back is that the way that the universe is behaving does not fit with the observations of what was then and what is now contemporary science. In other words, the rate at which this universe is expanding, it should be the effects of matter on the rate of expansion are not justified by the amount of matter that is observable in the universe. And in order for it to be the universe to be moving in the way that it does, they did their calculations and it necessarily has to be 95% more matter and energy than what they are able to perceive in any manner. And so science in its brilliance has given a name to this thing they can't see, can't find. They call it dark matter and dark energy. And if you ask for a description, basically the description would be, well, it's nothing that we can see. It doesn't reflect light. It doesn't show itself on the electromagnetic spectrum, but it's there. And uh, now it's being plugged into calculations. But this to say, the realm in which we feel ourselves most fluent, which is to say the realm of matter, the realm in which we meet each other, have our discussions, walk away feeling as if we maybe have some understand. That realm, what we would call normal matter, is 5% <laughs> of what's there. It should be humbling, but it also should be instructive. Our role in terms of transforming is within this whole band of the mind, where there are the choices that we can make. OK, so process. You know, the process is related to addressing this mind and its conditioned habits and redirecting it. So how do we do that? Yeah, I find myself coming back to this little simple expression. Uh, you are what you eat. <laughs> you <know? laughs> they had this show on, uh, I watched it. It was a documentary called Super Size Me, where a guy said, well, for 30 days, I'm going to see what eating only McDonald's will do to me. And so he did that. And of course, he gained 30 days. He gained 25 pounds. 
He had depression, anxiety, mood swings, all kinds of other things happened to him. His diet. You know, so that's in terms of the physical body. And we all know, you purify the things that you put into your body, it has an effect. You, know, you eliminate things that you know are bad for the body. And it does better. Surprise. And we relate it to the body. We generally don't take that next step in terms of what are the other levels of our being that we are continually in the process of feeding. And what is the nature of that nutrition that we provide to our emotional nature, for instance? What is it that we're feeding it on? And what does it form itself out of? What are the materials that we give it to take on its life and its expression? And you know, these are the things that we need to look at. You know, I could point to a number of things, but I think for each of us, these are things we need to ask. You know, is it a healthy diet for my emotions to be continually in a state of fear because I'm being told how dangerous this world is, how bad the people in whatever party you associate with those other ones, you know, how bad they are, you know, how they're leading us all to destruction. And, you know, you pick a side, it's the same story. I had a neighbor, it used to be many years ago in Chicago, everybody had front porches. And, you know, evening time after work, people would sit on the front porches and talk across the porch. You know, so you'd be on your porch talking to your neighbor on either side. Woman who lived on this side of me was named, or her actual name was Van Eden, but everybody just called her Miss Bob. <laughs> called her Miss Bob because her husband's name was Bob. <laughs> it's a southern thing, so I don't know if you get it. <clears throat> so Miss Bob would be over there, and you'd be talking across the porch to Miss Bob. Came a time when you'd come out on the porch, and she wasn't there. And she wasn't there for a little while. And so, you know, I'm wondering what's going on. I go and went and knocked on her door. And the conversation that we had became the habit of her conversation for the remainder of her life. She was an older lady. I said, Miss Bob, I haven't seen you up there. She said, oh, Tim, did, did you hear about what happened to that boy? I hadn't heard anything. Or did you hear about that, that shooting that took place? Uh, what shooting? I saw on the news. Didn't you hear? She would sit there. You know, she was an older woman. She was alone. And so her companion was you know, the news as it was being presented. And on that news, she was continually hearing about people doing harm to each other, about bad things that were happening. And it's nowhere around her, but that box was telling her that it's something she needs, and she took it to heart. Is that a good diet that we feed ourselves? These are questions we ask. So you are what you eat at every single level of our being. You heard what the Buddha said. All that we are is the result of our thoughts. So we can either say, okay, or we can recognize that this is something that not only we can take responsibility for, but this is an area where we can actually be quite proactive. Now, we can actually, it begins with a certain awareness of what it is that's in fact happening in the stream of our thoughts. I mean, it's one thing to say, I need to choose a better diet of my thoughts and emotions, but if we are not sufficiently aware of what it is that's continually flowing through us, well, it's just words, and we're just talking. So diet, and then I'd say the next thing, I didn't intend it to rhyme, but diet, then quiet. <laughs> 
I actually, I myself think that's good. <laughs> Diet and then quiet. My daughter, as some of you know my daughter, and you know she's a, she can be a talkative person, particularly when she comes home from work. She just, she can go, you know. And it's interesting, and it's fun, and it's loving. Every now and then she'll want to be quiet. And it's so easy to bait her out of her quietness. <laughs> you know, like, I think my wife takes particular pleasure in that. Angelique would be like, I'm just going to be quiet for a minute. Uh, Angelique, did you, did, you get, did you pick up that thing downtown? You know, she'll try. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, she's easy to break. But the other day she was there and she said, I'm going to be quiet. I said, okay. I'm going to respect your quiet, so I'll be talking, but don't respond. Don't, no, I didn't want her to, you know. And you know, she couldn't help. She'd want her. I said, uh, uh, no, no, that's not being quiet. So we're talking. I'm talking, and I'm saying, you know, you said five minutes of quiet. So during that five minutes, let me talk to you. And basically, quiet. It's not just not talking. You know, if you're going to be quiet, I'm speaking with you. Just let it pass through. Hear it. Don't grab on to any of it. Listen and let it go through. And then you'll be quiet. I, and you know, I, once I get her, I can go on and on. So I start talking. I said, because here's the thing, Angelique. You talk about quiet. There is quiet, then there is stillness, then there is silence. And these three things are conflated, are confused in the minds of many people, but they are qualitatively different states of being. So after five minutes ended, you know, she came out back to normal. You know. <laughs> Dad, you, know, you talk. You, know, you talk about being quiet, but you're always... I said, but here's the thing, Angelique. I can talk and be quiet. <laughs> I don't know if she got it, but... <laughs> quiet, stillness, silence. Very, very different levels of being but we have to begin at one end of the spectrum. So we begin with quiet. Only when we become quiet are we able to actually witness the processes of the mind, the thoughts that are continually flowing through. It's like clouds going across a sky. If we become quiet, we can just see them without feeling the need to grab any particular one of it and just follow it where it's going. Quiet comes first. Diet and then quiet. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that again and again. <laughs> so, in yoga practice, the yoga of Patanjali, same idea is there. He doesn't call it quiet, stillness, silence. Quiet, in a sense, we narrow the field so that everything that's coming in at us, we're not necessarily grabbing onto and processing. We narrow the field when we become quiet. When we become still, in stillness, there is no longer even the need for quiet. Then whatever it is that has become the focus is the only focus. Silence, all of the vestiges of the clinging, grabbing, attracted self fall away. Generally, it's momentary. But when it occurs, it's profound. But it begins with quiet. So, again, yoga, uh, Patanjali's yoga, these three things are called different names, perhaps. So he speaks about dharana which is really concentration. That would be quiet. We become concentrated. Dhyana, which is meditation. And then samadhi, which again occurs as the silence. Three more terms I think 
you can lie. I'm, a lot of these things I'm saying, you think about it for yourself, see where you come out with it. But three more terms we might think in terms of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Again, qualitatively different. Knowledge being the least of it, understanding being an activity of the intuitive mind that brings a sense of wholeness and vision, and then, of course, wisdom, the perception of reality unfiltered by any screen of self that we put between it. And when we start to get to this end phase, you know, whether we call it science, samadhi, or wisdom, really we step into a different realm then we're operating in a completely different realm of consciousness, of being. In a way, you could describe it as the realm of mystery. Because it's not something that's explainable. And the unfortunate fact for the conventional modern mind, you know, one of our authors, uh, and I forget her name now, but she died young, <clears throat> made the statement, Mystery is an embarrassment to the modern mind. The idea that there is something that cannot be defined, cannot be grasped, cannot be codified, is an embarrassment to the contemporary mind. We got to feel like we can explain it. And if we're honest, most things that pass for explanations are merely descriptions. They don't explain anything, they describe what's going on. But it's an embarrassment to the modern mind. So, mystery. And so that kind of brings us to this second aspect of this process of self-transformation. We've talked about the path, the gradual path, leading in that direction, which relates to the understanding and the cultivation of the mind. But then the actual experience of self-transformation is something very different from that process. And it occurs perhaps in relation to the process and perhaps not in relation to the process. Because you know, it's like lightning or it's like, again, that exotic scripture the Bible. <laughs> there are these words in Psalms that speak about this experience of transformation, the transformative moment. It says, he utters his voice, he being the divine God, the higher self, whatever the particular term that works for you. He utters his voice and the earth melts. It's a description. It's a description of the moment, the experience of illumination, where what was real, what was solid, what was certain, melts with this experience, this transformative experience. Often it's spoken of as, you know, the consciousness will change and it will come upon you like a thief in the night. All these poetic ways of expressing it. And you think about that. A thief in the night. It's dark. It's quiet. And someone comes into your place and steals from you everything that you hold valuable and takes it away. And you awaken to a house emptied of the things that you felt to be of value. And only then does this new day dawn. Very often people like to point themselves in the direction of enlightenment and think in terms of the wonders and the glories of it. 
as if it's uh, an experience of, you know, all day long, all life long, we're at the beach. <laughs> Maybe it's not like that. Maybe it's not like that at all. Because you look at the examples of people you can say had the experience of enlightenment or this sudden transformation. And, you know, who are some people that would come to mind? Obviously, the Buddha is one, the enlightened one. Yeah. His road to that experience of enlightenment took him right to the death door, where he almost died, but then came back and had his experience. You think in terms of Jesus' experience, which required for him crucifixion. Muhammad. He was a man who was of a spiritual nature, he would go on retreats in the mountain. One particular time, he had this experience where the angel Gabriel comes to him, holds something up in front of him, and tells him, read. But he can't read. He didn't have training in reading and writing. And then he says to him again, read. And this time, the human text, he's incapable of reading, but he read and recited what this presence held before him. And this was the beginnings of the Quran. But after the experience, he knew he had lost his mind. And he went to people saying, look, th this angel Gabriel came to me, showed me this thing I can't read, but I read. He thought he had lost his mind. He was preparing to throw himself off the cliffs because he felt like he was possessed. This was his experience of illumination. You know, it's not exactly a trip to the beach. But these are people who involve themselves. In these cases, these are people whose lives had been spent in some form of engagement in this process that we talked about before. Process of training, of directing the mind. But there are others who have the same sort of experience and, you know, no background that we're aware of. So, you know, Edgar Mitchell, he was an astronaut, one of the fellows who walked on the moon. He also founded the organization, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He had no spiritual practice, no training of any sort, but when he was coming back to the Earth in the spaceship from the moon, he's looking out the window and he had this kind of cosmic mystical awareness shifted his whole life and when he hit ground his focus was completely on demonstrating the primacy of consciousness through the science of the day so he wasn't one who was a spiritual practitioner but still he unfolded uh, there's a song that is said to be the most well-known song in the English language, most widely known. If I were to ask you what it is, not the Beatles, I'll just say that for now. If I were to ask you what it might be with someone. Amazing Grace. The most widely known song in the English language. It was written by a gentleman by the name John Newton, he was a preacher, a pastor, but like all of us, he had a life before he was a pastor. <laughs> and his life before he was a pastor included being someone who was actively engaged in the slave trade. So he was trading in human lives, gathering them up, putting them on the ship, selling them at his destinations, the ones that did survive the passage, and, you know, for a while it was an illegal enterprise, so all of the things you had to do in between. That was his background. And it was in the midst of that background that he had his experience of illumination. What prepared him for that? I mean, this event, this transformative event, Probably one of the most famous examples, one of the most well-known, is a, a gentleman who used to be known as a Saul of Tarsus, 
who was a man who was actively engaged in the persecution of the followers of this, uh, you know, this fellow who was claiming to be a messiah. He was actively involved in their persecution. No background leading him to such a magnificent transformation, but he was transformed as well. So, only to say this. There is a process that we could say perhaps conditions the soil for the appearance of some new life. And that's this process of cultivating the mind. But it is also something that can take place irrespective of that conditioning process. But to be transformed. I'll tell you a story. Around the world is one that's told to children, so I think it suits us. Uh, how, however uh, highly we may think of ourselves, I think some of these uh, spiritually based stories, the great masters and awakened consciousnesses that developed these stories, they knew who their audience was. They knew who we are and our particular level. And so they created stories. Actually, if you look at the scriptures of the world, one after another, they're all storybooks, which is a good thing. That doesn't diminish them in any way. But because a story has the capacity to fuel our imagination, I think that's one of the main ways that they taught. This particular story draws on a Sufi tradition. Um, it's called Fatima the Spinner and the Tent. It's not three things. Fatima is the spinner. So Fatima the spinner and the tent. Really easy story. Basically, this girl Fatima, her father was a spinner, which is to say they took the raw materials of wool or cotton and they would make it into yarn. Father comes to her one time and says, look, I'm going to go on a voyage, going to be selling some of our goods. You come along. Probably you might be able to find a suitable husband as we travel. She went along, everything was traveling by ship. Of course, the city she was traveling from was called the f city in the farthest west. So we'll talk a little bit about the symbols, just a little. So she travels, and on the way, they hit some bad weather, shipwreck, father dies, she ends up coming up on shore, hardly remembering anything. And some people find her and take her in. And these people make cloth. So they're weavers. And so she lives with them. And after a couple of years, she's kind of forgotten her hardship. And she's learned to be happy all over again. She's down by the beach one day. And some slave traders come, grab her, grab a bunch of people, take her away. And so now she's saying, my God, I was just getting happy. And now I'm gone again. They take her go a little bit further east and sell her to somebody in Istanbul. And she's fortunate because the guy bought her out of pity and he wanted to make her like a serving maid to his wife. But he runs on hard times and then they end up having to be, she has to work in his business. His business is making masts for ships. So she's working at that and she's so good at it, she's so thankful for this man's kindness, he gives her her freedom. Sends her on a mission one day saying, look, Fatima, I want you to take these masts and sell them for a profit in Java. So further east to Indonesia. And of course, you might guess at this point that on the way to Indonesia, yet another shipwreck, she lands up on shore in, this, in China. And so she cries out, you know, why is it that every time I start to become settled, something unfortunate happened. And of course, she got no answer. But then it turns out that in China, there was a prophecy that one day, a stranger would come from another land 
and the stranger would be a woman and would be able to make a tent for the emperor. And so this, this prophecy was so ingrained that every year they would send out people to all the villages to see if any foreign woman had come there. And of course, Fatima this year got called to come to the court of the emperor. And he asks her, look, can you make me a tent? Her response, I think so. I said, okay, do it. Okay, I need some rope. We don't have rope. So remembering her life as a spinner, she spun the flax together, made the rope. I said, okay, now I need stout cloth for the tent. We don't have it. Remembering her life as a weaver, she wove the stout cloth. I need poles for the tent. You know the answer. So her life as a mast maker, she made the masts. Then she had to go through her mind and think of what were all the different tents she had seen in the world. They hadn't seen tents in China yet in this story. And so then she made a tent. And the emperor rewarded her with anything that she wanted. And she stayed in China, raised a family, all of that. And she thought, too, it's remarkable how every one of these misfortunes was actually the source leading me to my ultimate happiness. So I mean, that's the children's version. But of course, there are deeper meanings there. And I think it relates specifically to this subject of tra self-transformation. And I'll be brief. The city she came from was the city in the farthest west. So the farthest place from the rising of the sun is where she began her journey. The first islands where she was shipwrecked were called the Middle Islands. And that's where she became a weaver. She stayed there. In that place, a new power, what would become a power, developed. Went on a mast maker. And at this point, she had gone all the way to Istanbul, further toward the light. A new power arises in her. And then, equally, that's where she gained her freedom. You know, one of the things about this journey of self-transformation, for the longest time, if you take a broad view, there is this view that we as human beings are part of a pilgrimage. Obviously, we think of this life and we focus on it, but this is not the first life we have lived in a body on Earth. This concept of reincarnation, this concept of a learning period, a gestation, and then commencing once again. Another body, another culture, another place. So there's this idea that for the longest time, until some sort of awakening takes place within us, we're pretty much like leaves blown by the wind. So whatever direction we're blown, you know, we just react. But a certain point arises when we begin to make choices. The whole point of speaking this evening has been to speak to those who feel they are, in fact, empowered to choose. So this occurrence of her freedom being given to her after having been a slave is descriptive of this moment. And from that, she goes and she again is shipwrecked in the farthest point to the east, China. In the known world of that time, you don't go any farther. So closest to the sun and its rising. And in that place is where she has to exercise all of these powers. What have become powers, what she thought of as unfortunate circumstances, it turns out are in fact powers. Each of us has a certain life we find ourselves engaged in. And every life has its difficulties. I mean, you may watch the famous celebrity shows, but you believe me, celebrities have problems. 
<laughs> Lots of them. So we all have these issues that we regard as difficulties, unfortunate circumstances. But to the extent that we wholeheartedly respond to what's right in front of us, we develop powers of various sorts. And ultimately, it's something that results in this sort of experience of self-transformation. In her case, she built a tent for the emperor. The emperor is the ruler of all things. She built a protected space where the emperor's influence could pervade that space. In a sense, we build this tent. We build this temple in which we cultivate within ourselves a sense of the presence of, in this story, it's the emperor, but the almighty, the divine, the higher life. We cultivate that sense and we build that space where it can express itself. That's the meaning of a life. That's the meaning of this experiment that we are engaged in, that we call our life. In many ways, your life is none of your business. <laughs> it's, it's a strange thing to say, perhaps. But you know, all of these fortuitous events and all of these strange events, most of it you have no direct control over. But what you do have control over is how you respond. And to the extent that you exercise that, then you move yourself toward a moment where Self-transformation is a possibility. You know, just to close it out, I think our normal approach to unfoldment is the idea that it's something that's gradual, cumulative, so that you know, once we find something like theosophy, we know that there are important books, and if we read a certain number of pounds of these books, <laughs> you know, there's a certain poundage where suddenly, okay, transformation occurs. Tr that's true for every tradition, or whether we participate in the rituals of a certain, that that will in some way uh, gradually lead us to the experience of self-transformation. It's not true. Information has value, yes. Knowledge is power, is what we're taught. But it's power at its level and not beyond. And so information does not transform. I'm sorry to tell you. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Information factual information, conceptual information. You're the same, but more informed. <laughs> you haven't changed much. You're better at cocktail parties, perhaps, <laughs> if you are willing to share. <laughs> but it doesn't change. What does? And I would say this. Obviously, I will have to define my terms but information does not transform. Inspiration does transform. By inspiration, I am not talking about motivational speaking. That's, you know, maybe something will happen. You know, maybe you'll feel up for a minute, but it's not transformative. Inspiration, you know, the word inspiration, Spirit itself relates to breath. So the inbreathing into you of, again, your term, you know, of the universal consciousness, of God, of the Almighty, of the divine, of all of the different terms, the one that you is most meaningful to you, the inbreathing into you is what is transformative. But, you know, there's a poem. Silesius, he said, 
God, whose love and power are everywhere, cannot come to visit unless you are not there. Unless there is, through whatever method that we utilize, an absence of the overwhelming presence of self and its wants, its needs, its demands, its insecurities, unless that can be quieted, there's no room for inspiration, for something to be breathed into us. So the directions that lead you toward that even momentary absence of self are the directions you perhaps want to pursue. It's no accident that when you think in terms of mystical transformative experiences that most of them happen in nature, where who you are and your importance is minimal. So I'll leave you with that that uh, self-transformation, we've studied it as a process, we've talked about it as an event, we've talked about some of the ways to approach it. I'd invite you to think it through for yourselves and uh, figure it out and see what works for you. Glad to be back in Chicago. <laughs> so you talked about the process and the journey. <clears throat> And then you talked about events, you talked about not being related. Do you feel that sometimes following or being conscious of the process and the journey makes you more receptive to an event? Or is it separate? Yeah. No, I, actually, that's one of those points that I didn't mean it to say that they are. I did, I think, say that they are not related. They are not necessarily completely related, although, you know, given this whole concept of uh, reincarnation, which is to say that, you know, the visible signs of your pre pre preparation during this life may not be there, but there have been countless previous lives that perhaps have fertilized the soil to make it much more easy for something to occur now. So probably in some sort of realm beyond our capacity to see, they are related. But certainly this whole idea of uh, these practices that are spoken of in all of the different traditions, they are focused on preparing oneself to be unselfed in a way. And when that occurs, whether it's through a tradition or whether it's just sort of spontaneous occurrence, then we're available for this experience. When you spoke about the distinction between the process and then the transformation, is the transformation then like a point of arrival or can you view it in terms of you transform to something and then process occurs again and then you transform to something more, like a more iterative step of the relationship between process and transformation, not a singular kind of, you know, metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, you know, the process is without end. You know, there was a book by J. Krishnamurti called The First and Last Freedom. Probably if I were the editor and I was doing, had responsibility for the title, I might call it the most recent freedom. That obviously there are levels beyond where any particular transformation may lead us. And so that's, yes. But from a human point of view, what those might be, uh, we can't say. Yeah, there's a saying uh, that the transformation is an accident. Uh, the process makes you accident prone. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. That's what uh, Edison said. That you know, the more the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. 